Hello, everyone. How's everyone doing? Um, I'm going to let you guys come in, get your seats, get comfortable, grab a snack, because today's conversation is going to be really good and really important um, here with Mr. Stamper. Um, he's going to have some great insight, great wisdom, and offer the opportunity to uh, raise some great questions and hear some awesome things from him. Um, before we get started, always, of course, we want to do uh, to acknowledge the land that California uh, San Bernardino sits on. Um, we recognize that California State University San Bernardino sits on the territory and ancestral land of the San Manuel Band of Mission Indians. We recognize that every member of the California State University San Bernardino community has benefit and continues to benefit from this use and occupation of this land since the institution's founding in 1965. Consistent with our values of community and diversity, we have a responsibility to acknowledge and make visible the university's relationship to Native peoples. By offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm Indigenous sovereignty and will work to hold California State University San Bernardino more accountable to the needs of American Indians and Indigenous peoples um, all over. So again, we want to thank you for joining us today in our conversation on race and policing. Before we get started, I want to offer some good news that has come um, since the last time we met. Um, one of the great things that has passed is the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act of 2020. Um, we all know about the unfortunate murder of George Floyd uh, last year, uh, which pretty much uh, started this conversation here um, with the students and the faculty. Um, upon many things that this bill does, a few notable mentions um, is that it limits qualified immunity, uh, lowers the criminal intent standard from willful to knowing or reckless to convict a law enforcement officer for misconduct. Um, it authorizes the Department of Justice to issue subpoenas and investigations of police departments for a pattern or practice of discrimination, and it creates a registry to compile data on complaints and records of po uh, police misconduct. Um, so I think that's a really good thing to advance uh, holding police officers accountable. In this nation, we can only move forward instead of backwards. And I think that having conversations like this um, is really important and think, and bills like the George Floyd of, and Policing Act is one way to advance this, uh, this movement. Um, before we get started, I wanna go ahead and introduce our, uh, our host today. Um, in this panel, Dr. Norman Harvey Stamper, who served in law enforcement for 34 years, six as a chief of police for the Seattle Police Department, will discuss his experience in the profession, sharing in the field insight on the nature of policing and how to effectuate substantive, substantive police reform. Dr. Stamper holds a PhD in leadership and human behavior and has published numerous articles and books on police reform. His books include Breaking Rank, a top cop's expose on the dark side of American policing and to protect and serve how to fix America's police. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and pass it off to Stan um, to give, or excuse me, I'm going to go ahead and pass it off to Mr. Stamper to just go ahead and start today's conversation. Thank you all for joining us. Zora Lynn, thank you very much. I want to start with a correction. Uh, only my mother called me Norman Harvey Stamper. So <laughs> I saw that written in advance of our time together. And I thought maybe I should say something. Uh, no, why get all hung up on that? Uh, but it just struck me as very funny when you used my full name, which, as I said, only my mother used, and it was when she was usually not real happy with me for some reason. But I prefer Norm and would invite people to call me Norm. Uh, I think it's critical to understand why policing has not advanced. I could put a period there. But I, I, I could also elaborate and say, not advanced uh, in the eyes and the hearts and the minds of reformers, uh, of people of color, young people, poor people, who have been on the receiving end of neglectful uh, or more often oppressive police practices. So, you know, year after year, generation after generation, event after event, we wring our hands, we gnash our teeth, uh, and nothing changes. Blue Ribbon task forces and committees and commissions are formed. Uh, we, we did see an extraordinary reaction, and I know we'll talk a little more about this, uh, after the George Floyd murder. Uh, something unlike this country has seen as a country. Every single state in this country uh, bore witness 
to, to very angry and very hurt Americans of all colors and all ages. It was like something really shifted after the George Floyd murder. And I think we need to visit that. But to answer my own question about why I believe we have not seen progress or sufficient progress. Uh, and, and, and that's because we have fixated on these events as we must. We, we, we need, as people following the trial know, we need to hold Derek Chauvin accountable for his cold-blooded murder of a fellow human being uh, back on Memorial Day uh, of 2020. He must be held accountable for that. Uh, the officers who beat Rodney King, the officer who shot Laquan McDonald in the back as he is walking away, the officer who shot Walter Scott as he was running away, the officer who shot that lonely 12-year-old boy on a snowy field in Cleveland, Tamir Rice, needs to be held accountable. And too often we don't see accountability. So it's important that we definitely focus on the event, focus on the incident, and hold those responsible uh, for the unacceptable, uh, I was going to say unacceptable, if not unlawful behavior. And, and if that means filing and prosecuting criminal charges, so be it. The police are not free of that level of accountability. But focusing only on the individual incident or event, it, it has over the years, I think, caused us to fail to recognize the deep-seated systemic implications of police racism, uh, of, of police misconduct in general, racism and discrimination in particular. It's time, I think, to do what many people are urging this nation to do in this moment of reckoning following the George Floyd murder. And that is to dramatically overhaul the system. I wanna conclude my brief opening remarks by offering a model for, for everyone's consideration. We look at the incident as we must, I've already talked about that. Then we need to tie that to the culture of policing, which is what obviously gives rise to police behavior. Attitudes, values, opinions, beliefs, traditions, uh, the formal table of organization, all those policies and procedures, everything uh, that influences behavior becomes part of the culture of any institution, uh, of your educational institution, uh, of, of uh, uh, corporate America, of, of, of uh, hospitals and businesses and NASA, every institution, every kind of company, business, or organization that you can think of tends to give rise to a culture, a workplace culture. What's, what's valued? What's appreciated? What's rejected by that culture? And so long as we focus only on the behavior of an individual officer and not the larger culture, we'll be missing a wonderful opportunity to really look at what might result in change down the road. And to get there, we need to take culture to a new level. We need to take it to, I, 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 th I think the, the, uh, uh, the direction in which we should be looking is deeper and deeper and deeper. We need to look at the paramilitary, bureaucratic, organizational scheme of things in American policing. It really has not changed. There have been a few, quote, waves of reform that have accomplished, frankly, quite little uh, over the years. But if generation after generation after generation, we continue to come back to the same problems, the arrogance of a police officer in approaching a 17-year-old Black kid on a street corner, for example, the use of excessive force, uh, 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 planting drugs, planting weapons and finding them. All, all these other uh, acts of individual police misconduct 
uh, acts of police racism, uh, sexism, misogyny, homophobia, every other brand of bigotry that you can imagine is coming from some place. And that place is the culture which is shaped by the structure. So if we want to get real serious about police reform in the United States of America, we've got to get real serious about rearranging the way the molecules are organized. We need a new system of policing, a new system of public safety, a new system guided, if not governed, by the Constitution of the United States, so-called procedural justice stop and frisk, uh, rules of evidence, search and seizure, laws of arrest, and God knows use of force. Those are the sort of procedural justice dimensions of the United States Constitution as they impinge upon public safety, upon policing. So if we wanna make a difference, we've, we've gotta do the very hard work, the heavy lifting uh, of rearranging the way those molecules are organized. That's why conversation about defunding, about dismantling the police are so important today. This is the first time they've merged uh, 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 what I would call maybe a protest class of people who've been in the trenches since they were very, very young and have never uh, shied away from the kind of conflict that is necessary to produce change in our society. What's fascinating, and I'll end on this note, is that I've never seen as many white middle-class Americans take to the streets as I saw uh, after Memorial Day 2020 and the murder uh, of, of, of George Floyd. They saw, rather than heard from a, an official police spokesperson, uh, or from the police chief or from the sheriff, they saw with their own eyes a murder being committed uh, by one American against a fellow American, by a police officer against a citizen suspected of passing a counterfeit bill. Hardly justification for snuffing out a human life. So we're at a point, I think, and I'll end on this positive note, when uh, a whole lot of people are prepared to join that effort to accomplish systemic changing, uh, uh, changes in policing. The institution cannot look the way it looked on May 24th. It cannot. It, it, it is time for fundamental, indeed, radical change in how policing is organized and carried out in, in this country. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Norm. Uh, as, a, as a police chief, when you were uh, the chief of Seattle, how, how was it for you to watch what you're talking about today go on? Extremely difficult. And, 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 and thank you so much for that question. It's, it, it's one that if I were the kind of person who's kept awake at night every night, night after night, that particular topic would be at the you know at the top or certainly near the top of the list. It's like, how many times do we have to go through these quote unfortunate or tragic incidents? How many times do we need to hear a police chief or a sheriff say, well, we've always got a few bad apples. Uh, so the challenge before us is to get rid of those bad apples, do everything we can not to hire them in the first place, and then get rid of them if they're amongst us. Well, nonsense. I heard Bill Bratton, whom I consider a, a kind of a distant friend and certainly a colleague, uh, commissioner of uh, NYPD, uh, uh, two different terms, and also police chief in Los Angeles uh, for a good long stretch. I heard him once address his command staff. His command staff, by the way, is bigger than the vast majority of police departments in this country. He has something like 800 command staff members. 
And he, he was doing just fine until that moment when he said, the vast, vast, vast majority of our police officers uh, have the right attitude and behave properly. It's those bad apples. That bad apple theory uh, has got to be shelved. Uh, yeah, we've got bad apples in police work, uh, but we've also got bad barrels, rotten barrels uh, and decaying orchards. And it's time for us to look at that whole system and, and recognize it's usual for me, it's usually not um, this sort of bad apple, bad cop theory. Uh, yeah, as long as those people exist, as long as they're here, as long as they're wearing our uniforms, then we need to attend to them. Of course we do. Prevent their hiring if possible, and then certainly address any uh, transgressions that they may commit in the course of their day-to-day -day duties. But I'm sounding like a broken record here, unless we can dig just a little bit deeper and say, wait a minute, what does that orchard look like? And what does that barrel look like? And how is it systemically that we dramatically increase the chances that officers will be sensitive and responsive and compassionate, that they will abide by the Constitution and treat people with dignity and respect? How can we do that? And, and, and of course, my answer is not by doing what we've always done. So it's time, it's time for a change. Yeah, it hurt to watch uh, it hurt, to, frankly, to watch Chop and Chaz. That terminology may be familiar to your to your viewers. Uh, during the course of the uh, 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 protests during uh, uh, 2020, especially in the summertime months, uh, we we had these 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 uh, efforts to seal off an area and keep the cops out. I understand that impulse, but it's a bad one from my point of view. For this reason, uh, if you keep the cops out and then you have a genuine emergency and you need uh, to protect human life um, and the cops have, have been conditioned to believing they can't go uh, down this street or into that block, or in the case of the East Precinct, they can't even go into their precinct house because it got closed off. There's something about the traditional side of me as a, as a cop that says, you, we need to find ways over time to be sure, and pretty much everything I talk about is not gonna happen by next Tuesday, but we need to find ways to bring community and police together with the community in the driver's seat uh, to create a new model of community policing. But in doing that, I don't believe it's smart to exclude the cops. So I watched that and I was dismayed by that. And I also saw police officers using tear gas against nonviolent and non-threatening protesters. Excuse me, I made that mistake in 1999 during the WTO, during the ministerial conference. Made the biggest mistake of my career during WTO wrote about it, put it in two different books, spoke about it, and yet that same mistake gets repeated ad nauseum throughout the country. Trot out the tear gas and apply liberally is, is, is the police tactic that we know is going to inflame passions, is going to escalate, not de-escalate tension. Now, other than that, I have no opinions about that subject. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Norman. And as a, as a chief, how was the battle with the unions? Uh, unpleasant, in a word. Uh, predictable, but unpleasant. Uh, in my first book, I wrote that, look, my kin are out of Harlan County, Kentucky, coal mining uh, country. Um, uh, you know, goes back to several ancestors. Um, and I have in my heart of hearts, a real affinity for the labor movement in the United States of America. The early labor movement particularly, but really labor in general. Um, and, I, and I firmly believe that uh, working people 
need to have their rights uh, and their working conditions uh, protected and advanced. And that's a major role of, of, of the unions. But I cannot say that about police unions because they have defended the status quo. They have defended bad cops. Now it's a part of their job to provide legal counsel or to provide this advice or that advice. But when police unions will not join uh, it, it, to the extent that they're welcomed or invited, will not join police reform efforts or citizen commissions who say, you know, we need to hear from the union. I invited them numerous times uh, to the advisory councils that I set up in Seattle in various communities, African-American, East, Africa, East African persons with disabilities, youth, uh, 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 Latinx, uh, uh, advisory councils, meet with me as often as you want. You, you determine the terms of our meetings. And, and so the African-American advisory council kept asking me, where's the union? And I said, they've been invited, they've been encouraged. I've gone to their headquarters to make a personal appeal. And they've said, we're not gonna be co-opted. We're not, yeah, I mean, that's the meta communication that they gave me. You know, we're here to protect and defend the hours, wages, terms, and conditions of employment of our police officers. Uh, and we're here to defend their reputation. And we're not going to get co-opted by some grassroots citizens group. Well, that probably tells you all you need to know about where the union's coming from. So they took me all the way to the Supreme Court on my promotional practices. I'm very happy to report that I won that battle. Uh, in an eight to one decision on the state Supreme Court, I should clarify, the state Supreme Court. But there, it, there's no need, in my view, for that kind of antagonism and that kind of myopia. Uh, you know, expand your vision. Look at what's in it for your members to develop a better, a much better relationship with the communities they serve. And you did talk about bad apples. And I think uh, one of the things you did mention is culture of policing. Yes. And, and I think, um, and, and I don't know why it is, but every chief is the enemy of the union. And I don't, I don't understand that. And I, I hope some chiefs have a good relationship with their unions, but um, talk a little bit about the culture of policing. Well, the culture of policing is uh, reducible in my experience and in my judgment. I was a cop for 34 years, 28 in San Diego, six as Seattle's police chief. And you'll still me, you will still hear me slip every once in a while and use the, uh, the, the, uh, the plural pronoun we. Because, uh, uh, you know, from age 20, when I took that police test, I was in the process of becoming a cop. And I spent most of my adult life uh, as a police officer. So I think I get that culture. I think I understand it. Uh, and here's one of the real uh, tendencies that unless you guard rigorously against it is gonna suck you in as a new cop uh, and change you forever. And that is this mentality that we're the cops and you're not. We are here to decide. We are here to act unilaterally and independently in cases of, of, of our community. Well, um, anybody who embraces whatever notion of community policing one embraces is if you're gonna be in partnership with your community, you need to think about what a partnership really means. Um, a partnership is not uh, I consult you after the fact. A partnership is we make this decision together. We set policy together. We decide who gets hired in this city, in this county, together. We decide what the curriculum at the academy is going to look like and who's going to present it. And by the way, it's not going to be exclusively cops. It's going to be a, a, a team. Uh, of subject matter experts, those who are uh, uh, have established credentials 
in, uh, uh, in, in substance use disorder, in mental illness, in, in so many other critically important areas when it comes to public safety. And, and so when the cops decide unilaterally, you're looking at a police department that does not embrace community policing. When you see the decision-making carried out jointly, you got, you got a, pretty good, um, a, a pretty good idea that at least that's an agency that's beginning to question, if not challenge this tendency to it, it sort of express this, we're the cops and you're not attitude. Um, I actually had a question. You had mentioned earlier about the um, how oftentimes you hear the notion or the statement that there's just there's just a few bad apples, and you you said that it's actually the, the orchards that are ruined. It's the the barrels that are ruined. It's not just a few. It's the whole. It's the system. So, in your opinion, um, with that being said, why do you think that we've come so far without holding police officers accountable? Um, with the, like what I mean there is that. If we've known for so long that there's been a problem with policing and there's been a problem with the way the police address community issues and individuals along all spectrum, why is it that we're that they haven't been held accountable this whole time? In your opinion, well, I, I believe Stan's uh, question uh, 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 really nailed it. Um, this this tendency uh, on the part of the unions. Um, to gain and yield increasing levels of power over policies and procedures. Hours, wages, terms, conditions of employment, I'm all for it. I've, I'll reassert my, my, my pro-labor credentials and say, you know, it, 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 it's, it can get me emotional thinking about people who have been mistreated in a labor force uh, and, and have organized to, to do something about that. And, and to, and to uh, strike out, in some cases, literally for uh, better hours, wages, terms, conditions of employment. But when those unions fight police reform of the type that, that you're talking about, Zora Lynn, it's time to examine the power that cities and counties and states have given them. They have worked to embed in contracts and in law certain provisions that I, that I think are very unhealthy for any community and very, very damaging to the effort to reform policing. Uh, the the uh, city of Seattle is under a consent decree, has been for a lot of years. Uh, it, it, uh, I retired in 2000, 10 years later, uh, the feds, came in, looked at the city and the police department and decided time for a consent decree, took it before a federal judge, the judge agreed, and that city was then bound uh, by a new set, uh, sort of an extra set of federal uh, dictates. And I remember listening as I, I live, actually, I live in a cabin on a mountain on an island. I say that to make people envious but I, that's where I live now. Uh, but I'm often in America, as we call it, I'm often uh, on the mainland and driving down Interstate 5 to get to Seattle, you know, for a talk that I've got to give or, or, or courtroom testimony or whatever. So I'm often traveling south on I-5 and I will never forget four or five years ago, uh, I was southbound on Interstate 5 and I heard the president of the union answer a question from a local uh, public radio host. He said, the judge kind of wagged his finger at you and said, if you think that your collective bargaining rights trump the United States constitution, uh, you've got another thought coming. And this officer, who was an officer of the Seattle Police Department, who had been elected by his peers as president of the guild, uh, a good guy, by the way, uh, was asked by this host, well, what are you going to do now? <laughs> and he said, what do you mean, what am I going to do? I am going to tell my members that we are bound to this 
uh, consent decree. We don't have a choice. And we will follow the dictates of that decree in letter and spirit. You know, I almost crashed my car. It was like, this is a union official. Uh, he really didn't have much of a choice when it came to the law because that judge was absolutely right. An individual political jurisdiction's collective bargaining contract uh, is secondary to the Constitution of the United States when it comes to clout. So, so I, ju I just thought it was a wonderful statement that he made. I wish I, I, he got, by the way, he got voted out of office next term. So that gives you an idea of, of the difficulty for somebody who says, I wanna go along, not just to get along. I wanna go along because it's the right thing to do. We want and need better relations with our own community and nowhere, excuse me, is that more important than in black and brown native communities, Asian communities. Nowhere is that more important than in dealing with young people and poor people and people of color. So uh, this particular union president, by the way, uh, was African-American, is presumably still African-American. And his attitude was, we've resisted long enough. We've dragged our feet long enough. It's time for us to uh, recognize the primacy of the Constitution and the morality uh, of, of our position, our responsibility to abide by these federal dictates by the Constitution. It was a, it was a kind of a magical moment. And I was thinking, yeah, th this is going to open the door to some real improvement within the rank and file. And what it did is open the door and boot the president out that door. So um, got a long way to go. Yeah, and I love how you said that, that it's not just about getting along, but it's actually about building a better relationship with the community you work in, and more specifically, black and brown communities, because uh, we, we obviously know how policing works um, there. And um, one of the questions that I wanted to ask you with that comment was what would be the first steps to build a better policing force in your opinion. I understand that uh, working in the community and having better conversations and finding uh, you know, qualified, like you said earlier about we shouldn't just be working to enforce law, but also to focus on like meeting the needs of the community, uh, working with mental health specialists and things like that. So what would you say is your first steps into building a better police uh, force for the nation? Well, it, it cannot and probably should not happen suddenly but here's, and I'll give you the abbreviated version of this because you've probably already gathered, I can go on forever <laughs> on these subjects. But for me, we need to um, it not, not merely invite citizen participation in everything from this day forward, policymaking, program development, crisis management, uh, the selection, education, supervision, disciplining of our police officers. There needs to be full, active, meaningful, legitimate citizen participation in all of that. In other words, start from the premise that the police in America, at least in theory, belong to the community, not the other way around. Uh, there are probably three police officers <laughs> in the country who subscribe to that ethic uh, because they've been taught the opposite. And that's, that's another issue, and maybe we'll get to that. But they've been taught to behave the way they're behaving. If nothing else, that should give us a little bit of sympathy and understanding uh, for the situation they're in. We're asking them suddenly to change their attitudes, suddenly change their behavior suddenly work uh, shoulder to shoulder and hand in hand with critics of policing. You know, we ought not to be just out there rounding up supporters of police to become partners. The most effective and viable partners are the ones who've got problems with us, with the police right now. So it's, it's vital, I think, that we start from this premise that from this day forward, however we structure it, however we stage and phase it, the citizens need to be involved. And I use 
citizenship in a very different way from anything associated with immigration uh, and, and, and with ICE and INS. I think it's just vital that we understand that the people need to be involved in policy making and program development and the like. And, and how I would do that just very quickly is organize, uh, and I wouldn't, I mean, and cops shouldn't. It should be done at the grassroots level. Plebiscites, uh, a census tract makes a lot of sense because a census tract is roughly eight to uh, 8,000 to 1,000 people. It's roughly uh, uh, on average 4,000 people. Well, what about depending on the size of a community, the size of a city or a county, uh, embracing this notion that each one of these census tracts will elect people to a very powerful authoritative body of police policy making and police oversight so that they are elected by their neighbor to, to, to serve in this capacity. This is just one person's way of envisioning how you could create this model, but they would, uh, they would assume a legitimate role with authority and by the way, with pay, uh, I, 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 I don't see from time to time I've written about volunteers and so on and so forth. So I apologize for that aspect of my past. But what I will say is that uh, if we want to make of this uh, come let us reason together, come let us analyze together, come let us build programs together, philosophy, then we need to have genuine partners, legitimate partners. If you and I are partners and um, uh, somebody's asked me to do something and I know that that's partnership territory and I don't consult with you, shame on me. That's very unpartner-like behavior. And it also completely undermines any notions of legitimate um, community policing. So I, I would start with this premise that we find a way in our 18,000 police departments in this country, a very complicating factor to everything that we're talking about. Home rule, local jurisdictions, you know, personal and local histories. There's all sorts of variables associated with what I'm talking about, but let's assume for the moment that we decide we're gonna embrace this model. Then, then something very, very different has to happen. And I am of the school that the citizenry uh, occupies uh, from the front seat of that car, the position behind the wheel. In other words, uh, uh, the, the citizen participants are the senior partners in that partnership, not the police. Now it's like a 51-49 arrangement. Uh, I will always harbor a belief that there are times, places, and certainly exigent circumstances that demand coercive force, that demand a conspicuously marked automobile and uniformed a person to get out of that automobile who has arrest powers uh, and who knows uh, how to handle himself or herself in a given situation. Um, for those who are arguing abolition of the police, I'm not among that group. I, I do not champion abolition. Uh, that's, that's not a partnership. And, and of course I am advocating partnership. So I, I, I would just say that, that however a local jurisdiction decides to structure it, and I've written about this in my books, but especially my latest book, which offers a, a description of how this partnership might be pulled off, uh, is that we really need to uh, to create a genuine, authentic partnership in which, in which citizens from local communities at the grassroots level are the senior partners. Thank you, thank you Norm. Um, you know, we had this, this COVID hit us a little over a year ago, and during the early stages, people were making decisions based on what they thought instead of scientific and also educational decisions. So we've had this meeting for almost a year, these meetings for almost a year, and, 
And during the meetings, we've met with some pretty smart and intelligent people like yourself. And so this is my question. Why haven't those educators and those experts been listened to over the years? In other words, had they been listened to over the years, instead of getting a dissent decree that somebody who knows what they're talking about has to put down the law, why mm -hmm. haven't over the years these departments brought in these experts and these scientists to say, if you do it this way, things will be get better? I, my response to that uh, humbly is that we are a, a multicultural society and culture is not merely race or ethnicity uh, or gender or sexual orientation or age. It's all of that and more. Uh, as a multicultural pluralistic society, we're saying, and a dem democratic society, everybody's got a voice. Everybody's got a vote. And, and, and we certainly learned that painfully from my point of view in 2016, where, where some people put into office somebody who should never have been elected to, to national office. Uh, that's a, obviously a, a bias and I express it freely uh, and I don't do it to piss anybody off. Uh, I just, off, I'm offering as a member of this multi-pluralistic society, a different point of view about the previous administration from what I hear from a number of people. And so let's accept the fact that there are people who want cops to be tougher in this society. There are uh, people who want police officers to bend the law. Uh, the the, the uh, supreme leader of the land told a police conference, don't be so kind to these people you arrest. And I see cops protecting heads when they put, you know, uh, handcuffed people in the backseat of a caged police car. Well, stop that. You don't need to do that. Well, and of course, one of the wonderful and strange and really troublesome aspects of a pluralistic society that uses the vote to elect local officials, state officials, national officials, is that we wind up with some people uh, offering advice, counsel, or in some cases, executive orders and rulings that are really inimical to everything that, that certainly that I believe should be happening in the name of police reform. So uh, I think uh, people are disinclined, some people are disinclined to listen to those intelligent, well-educated specialists. You know, if, if it, it, do I want somebody, uh, you know, in the bar uh, 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 determining uh, what public health policy should be during a time of a pandemic? For that matter, do I want a governor of Texas to decide whether or not it's time to take off masks? I want to defer to experts, to specialists who spent their entire adult lives, in many cases, most cases, studying, researching, double blind studies, so that you, know, you rule out bias and you come to some hard facts, some hard truths, uh, you know, ab about what a very dangerous virus can do to a community, to a city, a county, a state, a nation, a world. We need to be listening to experts, but who are we listening to? We're listening to some wing nuts on talk radio. We're listening to uh, people who are anything but experts, but they're like me in that respect. Even if they don't have expertise in a particular area, they got opinions and they're not reluctant to express them. The problem, whether we're talking about a, an extremely deadly virus uh, or police misconduct, is that there are consequences and people get hurt. Um, I was gonna ask you, you had mentioned earlier that you started your time in the force at 20 years old. Um, I'm currently 20 years old and I couldn't imagine taking on such a huge responsibility like that. Um, would you say that at 20 years old, mentally, emotionally, and as 
preparing as an officer, do you think that you were given the right tools? Do you feel like you were prepared to take on such a re great responsibility? Absolutely not. Uh, I was absolutely not prepared psychologically, emotionally, intellectually. Uh, and here's the real kicker in terms of what I now know about brain development. I wasn't there yet. I wasn't an adult. I may have, now I, I took the test at 20, got hired at 21. So let's assume that at 21, uh, my brain and, and the sort of emotional and, 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 uh, and, and mental maturity that goes along with, with development uh, has reached its acme. But we know that that's not true. We know that it's at age 25. Uh, and that's universally recognized by neuroscientists, by others who are true experts in adolescent, young adult uh, development, childhood development for that matter, because we can't ignore that. Childhood experiences are terribly important to how we behave as adults 10, 15, 20, 30 years down the road. So uh, no, if you're 20, you're way too young to be a police officer. You lack, it's, not, it's no judgment against you. Every other human being who happens to write 20 on age on that form uh, is in the same boat. Now, I thought I was mature, uh, of course, which is one of the most obvious signs that I wasn't. <laughs> I, thought I, was, <laughs> I thought I was brilliant. I thought I was smart. And my God, I'm, I'm now a police officer. Look at myself in the full length mirror wearing a police uniform with awesome decision-making authority resting on the calls that I make out there on the streets. Cra that's crazy making. We don't want 20 year olds. If we could get by hiring only 25 and up, that's what I would do. Uh, it's really, really difficult to accomplish that. But if, if we begin to get really thoughtful about how we want our police force to look, how, how we envision its makeup, uh, and if, in fact, it is of reduced size because we have sufficient help from the mental health uh, and, and, uh, and, and drug dependency and other disciplines out there, that, that maybe we could somewhere down the road hit that minimum age of 25 rather than 21. And I think that'd be smart. And, and Norm, uh, I always bring this up. I was a 34-year firefighter. And I remember um, I got on at 20 years old. Yep. And I remember my first four years more vividly than I do the rest of my years. And my nightmares are about the first four years because I was immature. You know, I didn't know what death was all about and, and uh, brutal TCs and so on and so on. And, and as we have these talks, 25 years old keeps popping up in a lot of our experts' conversations. How can we make that happen? Well, I, we, have to, we have to either accept the fact that our police forces, our fire departments, our uh, emergency services in general are gonna be smaller. They're going to be, uh, if, if we decide, for example, to impose uh, a, a, a minimum age of 25 in those service areas, then we're not gonna get as many people. We're certainly not. And one of the real problems is that when it comes to recruitment of women and people of color, if you're between, let's say 20 and 25, you're gonna be much in demand for other walks of life, for other occupations and vocations. And, and the recruiters are gonna jump all over you. And, they'll, and that will put you on a career track where you're making money and, and achieving promotions and starting families and doing all the other kinds of things that a lot of young people do. And it's like, well, I can't become a cop now. I can't become a firefighter. I'm, I'm, I'm basically committed to this career track. And indeed, it may be the love of your life. It may be you may have a real passion for this, this work at Amazon <laughs> or whatever. But, but uh, public service employees are in stiff, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're very definitely in competition. 
uh, uh, public departments, taxpayer supported departments are very much in competition uh, with private industry. And, um, and uh, you know, if you set your minimum age at 25 and, uh, and, and a major corporation sets theirs at 21, uh, and, and, they're, and they usually put a lot of money <laughs> into recruitment and, uh, and hiring practices, and they wind up snatching up all the best talent out there and, and, uh, and we just simply don't have enough candidates. I feel as though that would be um, both kind of like a good thing and a bad thing um, because it would, when we build, um, and I'm hopeful that we'll build one day a better police force. So one day when there's a, a better police force that commits itself to the community rather than the community committing to it, um, I think that we would have, you know, I hope for that day um, you had suggested that it would limit the candidates and it would limit our police force. Do you think that by raising it to 25, as we, as you had said, Stan, is that all the professionals and all of our guests ha have even said that 25 is the adequate age. Do you think that by pushing that age out, it would kind of weed out the people that are doing it for the wrong reasons? Um, are you asking me that or Stan? Yeah, because I, I feel like it, yes, it would limit our uh, police force, but then it would also, if I, if my dream is to become a police officer, if, if I got to wait till 25, then I'd wait till 25. So with that being said, if that's the new limit that we would one day get to, do you think that would help uh, weed out people that are doing it for the wrong reasons? Uh, I, I really don't. And here, and here's why. Um, if, if, for example, at age 18 and 19, 17, 18, I'm looking at college, what I want to study, what discipline appeals to me, what occupation or profession down the road is, is something that I envision myself, uh, you know, embracing, doing, uh, then I'm, I'm, and let's say that it is policing. So I go to school, I uh, you know, maybe I go to a community college, get 60 units of general education. Maybe I go, I go on to start taking upper division classes and so forth uh, at a four-year institution. Uh, and all that time, realistically, uh, more likely than not, uh, I'm either not making money and feeling a strong economic crunch maybe aided and abetted by my parents who want me out of the house, but whatever this personal situation might be, um, there's a lot of time between 20 and 25. And that makes me very vulnerable, like, like low hanging fruit for these corporations, for private sector employees to come along and pluck me off. Uh, and then if, if, if they do, um, if they do a good job of welcome me, welcoming me into their community uh, and their professional workplace, uh, providing incentives and paying me well, particularly, the likelihood that I'm gonna stay is very, very high. I may even go to a different company, but within the same industry, the same area. So I, I, I think we're up against a practical reality. And that is, unless and until we value policing as a profession, and we do not. And we were to say, that means that you are required to uh, develop a body of knowledge before we ever put you in one of our uniforms or slap on one of our badges or strap on one of our guns around your, your, your waist. We are going to make sure that you're the kind of candidate that we really want. And so uh, it's during that extremely vulnerable period that you're gonna get candidates, I believe, who will be saying, you know, I can't do this. I can't, I can't you know, uh, uh, sort of mark time for five years awaiting my opportunity, you know, to go out in a police car and, 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 and behave as a living emblem of professional policing and do the kinds of things that we're talking about here. So I'm just, I'm pessimistic, I have to admit. And Zora Lynn, uh, I was a commodity. 
when I got on the department, I was a commodity, like Norm says, and they wanted me on their department. And at 20 years old, um, that wasn't my first chosen profession. I actually wanted to be a, a teacher, but um, they actually recruited me, hired me, and and like Norm said, between the time I was 20 to 25, the amount of money I made in parallel to my uh, other friends who went to college and then got a job, I was head and show. I owned a house by then. Yeah, and they were still struggling uh, to establish themselves in a job. And also, like Norm said, and and I, I'll say it to you, Zorlin, you could be a police officer today, but your studies is going to take you into you said legal. And so if your studies are going to lead you to legal, then you could be a lawyer while your 20-year-old uh, recruiter is going to be a policeman. So you, there, there's so many obstacles along the way that will detour you. Uh, one of the questions, uh, Norm, is um, uh, have you seen the uh, fight for the soul of Seattle? Have you uh, seen that? Are you talking about the local television uh, station that produced yeah. a, a, a documentary? Yes. Yeah, I have. I okay. have. It's, it's, it's hard to watch. Uh, I quarrel with certain uh, uh, conclusions here and there. But in general, it's describing a, a, a Seattle that a good number of old time Seattle see uh, and, and, and breaks their heart. You know, because they thought of Seattle uh, as a uh, welcoming city. They thought of Seattle as a, uh, uh, a progressive city. You know, when I hired on as the police chief in 1994, I was confirmed by nine Democrats. And that meant that I left a city that, is, as I recall, I'll make this up because I'm not sure, that, uh, three or four at least, uh, of, of the uh, nine member council were Democrats, the rest were Republicans. So I essentially left a Republican town to come to a, a, a Democratic town, uh, but, but uh, they saw uh, Seattle as clean and safe. And then they saw the, the, uh, the riots, they saw the homelessness, they saw the tents springing up everywhere throughout the city and the imagery of that was jolting and jarring. And uh, if we're talking about, and I assume we are, the, the, the same documentary, uh, it's become certainly the topic of conversation throughout the city. Another one of the questions, and I went through this myself, and I, I, I'm chuckling at the question, it just says, um, some of the public service jobs has, have physical requirements. Would a younger age like 21 uh, be better opted since the goal is that the candidate uh, should be on the job longer or just the physical requirements to get on the job? At 25, you may not be as physically fit as you are at 21. And, and I remember uh, I lapped circles around the 25 year olds when I got off my physical. Yeah, I don't wanna hear about it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I would, I, would, I will tell you, if, if you're worried about, as a 20-year-old, if you're worried about what kind of shape you're going to be in at 25, do something about it would be my suggestion. Uh, because if you have to pass a physical strength and agility test, and let's assume it's job-related, non-discriminatory, is not biased against women candidates, which frankly has been the barrier for so many women for so many years, uh, then, uh, you know, you have to keep that in mind. You have to recognize uh, that you've got basically five years on your own. You know, once you, once you hire on, you're going through the academy, you're going to be taking physical fitness. Uh, uh, you, you will be subjected to physical fitness testing throughout your academy period. And then in smart departments, you'll come back. Uh, on a periodic basis to reestablish 
that you are physically fit for the work. I, I happen to embrace the bias that if we maintain physical fitness, that's helpful to our emotional fitness. It's helpful to our outlook on life and to how we communicate with people and solve problems. I mean, you know, if I'm feeling um, lazy and, uh, and, and in a weakened state physically, that's likely to affect my outlook. It's likely to affect my reasoning. Uh, and it certainly could affect, you know, <laughs> whether I uh, 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 prevail in a physical confrontation or fail in a physical confrontation. So uh, as long as policing is anything what it looks like today, and I suspect that it always will have aspects of that forever, then we need to maintain physical as well as emotional fitness throughout our careers. Thank you, Norm. Our, our fearless leader, Mary Texera has, Dr. Mary Texera has a question for you. Hi, Norm. Hi, Mary. I, How I, are you? I have to apologize because I'm hearing feedback. Anybody else hear that? I'm hearing an echo, but I can yeah, certainly hear your words. Okay, let's see if we can, I think I'm, I'm logged in twice. Anyway, <laughs> uh, I, I think that the last question was a good opportunity to talk about how um, physical fitness is, is over, uh, let's see, uh, it's overblown. Um, cops don't get into that many physical uh, altercations, do they? They do not, which I would argue, and I hope I'm not cutting you off in your question. No, no, not at all. I have, a, I have another question too. Okay. In fact, I have a list of about 25 questions, Norm, and I'll, I'll limit them to two. Oh, well, you're very kind. I, I mean, I'm fine with 25, but, but uh, others might not be. Uh, here's my take on, on physical fitness. If you don't need it very often, but when you do need it, it's a dire need you better get physically fit and stay physically fit. That doesn't mean you have to be a zealot. It doesn't mean you have to run marathons. What it does mean is that if you can't run a half a block uh, to, no. to chase down a gunman who's shooting at people, if you, if you can't handle yourself, if somebody takes a swing at you, uh, then you maybe want to reflect a little bit on your level of physical fitness. And I do okay. believe firmly that physical and emotional go hand in glove. Absolutely. So it's maintaining a reasonable level of fitness. But I agree, uh, uh, there are some agencies and some individuals within those agencies who have taken uh, physical fitness to what, uh, what I guess we would call an extreme. Uh, and, that, and to me, extremes are extreme. <laughs> And, and, and it seems like it has been used to eliminate people. I mean, I've, I've spoken with so many women who talk about getting over that six foot wall. Uh, and we know that women don't have the upper body strength to get over, you know, to pull themselves over a wall. So there are ways that you can do it. But nevertheless, it, um, there just seems to be in, in policing academies so much emphasis on the physical that that we, we, um, we sacrifice um, de-escalation tactics, we sacrifice talking, we sacrifice uh, all of those things that can lead us to uh, um, a, uh, you know, a, a conclusion that is not taking somebody to jail or yeah, a conclusion I, that isn't hurting anybody. I, I agree with you completely. Uh, and, and that sort of uh, raises for me the question of so-called stress academies. Yes. That we are going to put as much stress on these brand new police officers as we can to see whether or not they break and whether or not they, they would likely break in a real world situation. And we create this very artificial, very unrealistic environment in which physical strength and agility uh, is inflate, the need for the importance of yes. is inflated. Uh, and, and yeah, I'm, 
it, it really does come down to set a reasonable standard, reasonable job-related non-discriminatory standard, and then enforce that standard. Uh, it, it's, 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 it's important that if you're gonna hire uh, an individual to do patrol work, uh, to be on the streets at three or four o'clock in the morning or three or four o'clock in the afternoon, that you are capable of responding intellectually, mentally, psychologically, emotionally to the situations that you're going to confront. It's all got to be job related and it's got to be non-discriminatory. And I, I would say uh, in complete agreement with you that there are those academies uh, and, and testing procedures that carry things to extreme. Uh, my other question had to do with, uh, again, you know, the relate, you know, this is a, this is a, a series on race and the police. And I've always uh, felt like the broken windows, uh, pr uh, the, the broken windows approach to uh, policing is very discriminatory, um, uh, directed at African Americans and poor people and Latinos. Would you mind commenting on that? I would be delighted to uh, the, the uh, two of my former colleagues, uh, James Q. Wilson and George mm -hmm. Kelling, uh, parented that theory. Uh, and, and, and before his death, James Q. Uh, was saying, people got it all wrong. And George Kelling would say occasionally, people got it all wrong. I'm not so sure that people got it wrong, uh, but I'll give them the benefit of the doubt. And here's what I, I, I think they would say they were trying to say. If you ignore, in, let's say, an impoverished community, if you ignore a pothole in the street uh, or a series of broken windows in a deserted building, if the conditions of living in that neighborhood, living, working, playing, worshiping, whatever, in a given neighborhood uh, is... Uh, uh, scary to you as an individual or off-putting to you as an individual for whatever reason, then, you know, what's wrong with fixing it up? What's wrong with filling that pothole, replacing that, that, that bulb for the street lamp that used to make you feel safe when you wanted to go for an evening walk? Uh, and the short answer to that is there's nothing wrong with that. But like so many other waves of history and, and involving the police, particularly, uh, the police overreacted. Once again, I'm giving uh, uh, my, my two former colleagues every benefit of the doubt, uh, that they, they were onto something pretty smart. It's like, why would you disadvantage further poor people by not taking care if you're the city, not taking care of that neighborhood? What message are we sending that people in an affluent residential neighborhood get their lights replaced, you know, it seems the moment they burn out and, the, and those potholes filled as soon as, you know, they swallow a Buick, you know, that sort of thing. So it's, it's, it is important, I think, to recognize the upside of the broken windows theory. The downside is throughout the country, in city after city, uh, police in general use the broken windows theory to systemically discriminate against uh, poor people and particularly people of color. And, and so uh, they start enforcing and enforcing and enforcing. That's not necessarily what Wilson uh, and, and Kelling were talking about, although you'll find it there. It, it, was, it was more about taking care of the neighborhood, taking care of the community. So now it's being used and has been for several decades, being used as an excuse to, to uh, hassle, to oppress, to discriminate against uh, people of color and poor and, people. And, and let me point out to our audience that Sandra Bland, you know, who was um, stopped in, uh, in Georgia, uh, was stopped, uh, for failing to make a signal, a, a, sign, a lane change signal. And it was, the, the cops were, I just listened to a podcast. Or in fact, I read um, 
uh, Malcolm Gladwell's book on uh, talking to strangers. And he, he talks about how this cop was behind her. He saw this out of state license plate, Illinois license plate. So he, ha he had to have what was what we call a pretext, right? We have to have a reason for stopping you. And so he gets up behind her. She makes a signal to move because uh, she, she moves over because the cop is right behind her and he knows that she's not there for him. Yep. So he tickets her for that. And three days later, she's dead in, in her jail cell. So I think you're right. It has been used um, for very, very um, unethical uh, reasons. And, and unfortunately, sometimes people wind up dead. So thank you for that that uh, that perspective, Norm. Of course, of course. Sure. I think Robbie has a you question. Have to go. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Norm. I, I finished reading your book late last night. I, I mentioned that to you before we got on the program, and I I really like I really like your your courage and authenticity. And in chapter, I believe it's chapter eight or nine, racism in the ranks. You talk about how you interviewed a lot of your officers, and many of them. Uh, were frank and said they did they did use uh, many racist and derogatory remarks, but also so did the African American officers. I was wondering, could you explain that dynamic and does that phenomenon? Did you see that phenomenon at other departments as well? Yeah, I'll see if I can get get through this answer with it without getting weepy. Um, I had in, in nineteen. Um, it'll come to me in the in the seventies three police officers all on probation, meaning they're still within their first year of tenure with the San Diego Police Department, elected to resign for different reasons. One didn't want to be a cop. He, he, he thought he did. He uh, got a taste of it and decides not for me. Uh, another went to the Secret Service, uh, which most people would define as a pecking order promotion. Uh, and the other went back to his job uh, uh, no, the other the other went to the uh, San Diego County Marshal's office, a different kind of policing. But all three of them said the same thing, and that is they saw racism within the ranks, uh, different beats, different assignments, different shifts, hours of day for each of the three. So independently, they come to the same conclusion that they want to re resign, and independently, in their exit interviews, they all uh, essentially accused the police department of racism, of discrimination. I was a captain at the time, and this will uh, uh, resonate with any police officers who may be out there. Captains at the time in San Diego went around the clock. In other words, we were shift commanders and we were responsible for the entire 400 square mile city and every police beat on it for eight hours. And during those eight hours, uh, I had officers working in Mission Beach and La Jolla and you know, near, up near the Wild Animal Park and down by the border and in Southeast San Diego. And the officers assigned to Southeast San Diego, um, well, these three cops had all worked Southeast San Diego, which was a predominantly black community at the time. It's more culturally diverse today, but at that time, you said Southeast San Diego, everybody had a picture of a black community. And so um, instead of round filing those reports, those exit interviews, the chief to his everlasting credit uh, at that time, this would have been 1976. The chief at that time said, we can't let this stand. We need to investigate these, these allegations the use of racial and ethnic slurs, a slower, more apathetic response to black on black crime, uh, discriminatory, uh, discriminatory practices uh, of, of every conceivable description. And uh, so he brought a number of people together. I was fortunate to be one of them and said, how do we get to the bottom of this? Well, we could do an internal affairs investigation. Uh, we could also conduct a study rather than an investigation because investigation was always the response. And it's a responsible response. Find out 
what was meant by that specific incident or that specific event. Or we could say just how extensive is the use of racial and ethnic slurs within the San Diego Police Department. If we wanna to get to the bottom of that, it's not gonna happen through an internal investigation. It's gotta be a study. So I proposed, let's study this. Let's have each of the three captains going around the clock. Let's have each of the three captains call in each of the officers, every single one of the officers assigned to Southeast San Diego on their particular watch and ask them a series of questions that bluntly I developed. So we developed a, 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 a set of 31 questions uh, and we all contributed to that process. I wrote the original and then we fine tuned it. And then each of us over probably a month and a half to two months interviewed every officer, it was hundreds, interviewed every officer working for us. I had on graveyard 31 officers. I, I had 27 beat cops, three sergeants, and one lieutenant. Now I'm asking each of these individually in a private room, in my case, in the middle of the night to answer this question. Do you use, or do you, do you, it started with other officers. Do you hear the use of racial and ethnic slurs? If so, how often, under what circumstances, so on and so forth, do you personally use racial and ethnic slurs? Uh, and under what circumstances, what's the context? Do you use, have you ever used excessive force under any circumstances? Could be ratcheting down on the handcuffs, uh, could be not protecting the head when putting a prisoner in, car, in, a, in a police car. Could be any one of a 101 different possibilities in which force might be a factor. So we asked all of these questions as open-ended questions generally to try to get them to talk and talk they did. The 31 cops that I interviewed in the middle of the night over a several week period um, said this, yes, I use racial and ethnic slurs. 30 of the 31 cops I interviewed said that they did. One of the sergeants, and I believed him because I know the guy said, I, I don't use that language. I don't use that language on the job. I don't use that language off the job. I don't, he's a white cop. I don't use that language, my family. I don't use that language anywhere. And when somebody does use that language, I say something because I'm personally offended by that. This is a white cop saying he's offended by that language. So I asked all 31 that question. 30 of the 31 said yes. 77% admitted to using excessive force. Uh, somewhere around 71% said, uh, uh, yeah, I do respond, uh, uh, essentially, the question was phrased differently, more apathetically or slower to black on black crime, which is clearly discriminatory uh, and, and suggests that people of color are not getting uh, adequate police service. It, it was very, very revealing and very damning. So at the end of that phase of the investigation. We had three or four phases to the investigation. This was the most crucial. This was going face to face with our own cops and saying, do you use those terms? And then uh, I, I couldn't let it rest. I asked, tell me the terms you use. Uh, I will never repeat them. Uh, I wrote them in my report, so they're there. Uh, it was disgusting, it was deplorable, it was inhuman. Uh, it, it was uh, you know, a reflection on each and every individual, but it was ultimately a condemnation of cops and the cop culture and the way we as an organization uh, were treating people. And this is at a time when this new chief that I was just praising had come on and said, these walls have heard for the last time the N word. You use that language around here, you're fired. 
you will not be, this is the 70s, you will not be a San Diego police officer if you use that language. And of course, I'm giving him a standing ovation and saying, you know, it's about time. Because the previous chief, I, I won't quote him directly, the previous police chief was being sucked up to in the hallway outside an office I happened to be occupying at the time by a, by a commander, an inspector. So are you gonna, are you gonna run for mayor, chief? And that, that individual chief said, I can't because the quote, Mexicans don't like me and use your imagination when he referred uh, to African-Americans. I, 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 I was sickened, I was appalled. I should have gone immediately in, into that hallway and confronted him in that moment. I didn't as a source of shame in my life. Uh, and, and, and not the only source of shame in my life. I don't want to sound like uh, uh, that, that I uniformly practiced what I preached as, you know, what practice what I'm preaching now as a cop. Um, I, I can tell you that I had my comeuppance when I was a, a, a rookie cop. And a principal prosecutor standing in the hallway of the courthouse in San Diego asked me, as he is reviewing a case that I had submitted to him, if the Constitution of the United States meant anything to me. Oh, I was enraged. First of all, uh, I was embarrassed. And I was enraged. And then I was just saturated in shame because he had busted me. Uh, this happened to be a 19-year-old white kid that, whose constitutional rights I had violated. And this prosecutor had the nerve to question me about that. Standing there in his sharp three-piece blue pinstripe suit with his slick back hair and his tortoiseshell glasses looking like a Hollywood version of some kind of a, 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 a lawyer. And... Uh, by the time I slithered down the stairs of the San Diego County Courthouse, I was saturated in shame. He had done what I should have done on previous occasions, and I can name them, uh, and won't because this is getting too personal, I think. But it was, it was an awakening for me, a reckoning for me that I will never ever forget. Uh, and it's, vital, I think, to understand the, the role that individuals can play in helping to change this systemic problem that policing faces. So back to the Southeast investigation, as it was called. We, uh, we changed a lot of policies and a lot of procedures. And by God, we did fire a police officer who used the N-word. And we let it be known that he was fired for that express reason. And there's just, as much as education is important, as much as training is important, and sensitizing police officers and uh, creating new policies and procedures, there's no substitute for a boss doing his or her job and saying, unacceptable, here's the consequence. Yeah. But what about the unions? The unions will fight because it. Because today the unions course. would say you can't fire somebody for saying the N-word. Yeah, well, let them take their best shot. I mean, you fire them. And, and if you get overturned, you get overturned, but you don't go down without a fight. You, you're telling me, union, and you understand, Mary, that I'm talking to you. <laughs> I'm projecting mightily here. My experience dealing with unions in San Diego and in Seattle. By far, the most troublesome, vexing union was Seattle. Because Seattle is kind of an East Coast town on the West Coast. In San Diego, it was more an association, more an employee association. In Seattle, quite different. Uh, and, and different presidents behave differently. And the one that I'm thinking of when I describe uh, unpleasant experiences with police unions was somebody who was just basically saying, uh, if you do that, we're taking you to court. We're gonna file a grievance. We're gonna fire an unla unfair labor practice against you. And my attitude was, go for it, take your best shot. 
but let's try to get to some common ground before you get to that point. Uh, they don't want to do it because they don't want to be seen as friendly with the brass. They don't want to be seen as being co-opted by the police chief. But it's important that bosses assert their authority because there's nothing like a non-negotiable expectation that says you do not engage in racism, sexism, homophobia, or any other brand of bigotry. If you're a misogynist, go find another line of work. We do not want you in this workplace. And if you, it has to be behavioral, if you behave, the language you use is behavioral, if you behave uh, as a bigot in this police department, you're toast, you're gone. No ifs, no ands, no buts. You may be a really good homicide detective. You may be terrific at, at catching stick up men. Uh, more power to you but you're not gonna be a police officer in this town using that kind of language. Uh, and we used to say, well, God, you don't wanna to try to suppress the language because it's gonna come out somewhere else and so on and so forth. I said, yeah, if, if you allow that person to wear that uniform, today's uh, Wednesday, if they show up in uniform on Thursday, you're saying that that behavior is still acceptable. So you gotta get rid of them. And, and um, I, I, I have strong emotional reactions to that because I think there are a lot of chiefs that are altogether too beholden to the union and altogether too willing to compromise principles and values and ultimately ethics uh, because of the strength of the union. We need, to, we need to systematically and intelligently without compromising their role uh, protecting employee rights, we need to send a message to our police unions uh, that if you try to stand in the way of police reform, you miss this part. Uh, we, we have a federal judge in Seattle who will tell you, you think your collective bargaining rights trump the Constitution of the United States, you better think twice. It doesn't, it. doesn't happen. You know, I said I was driving at the time. I, I, I was lucky I didn't hit the car in front of me. I want to stand. <laughs> I want to give him a standing ovation. <laughs> well, you know, uh, fantastic. On, on the fire department, we had a young man, black man, come in, and his name was Robert. And uh, if you called him Bob, he would correct you. Yeah. My name's Robert. Yes. Well, that was the wrong thing to do because they they bobbed him out of the department. He literally, he literally could not stand being called Bob and he corrected them every time and it got so bad that they, he retired. He actually went back to his old job, which was air conditioning and plumbing. And so they bobbed him out of the, out of the department. This, well, question, this question comes up, uh, Norm, every, every week. And um, under the fact that they are getting the jury together for uh, 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 Chauvin's uh, uh, court case and um, the question is, is, why is it so hard to convict the police? Uh, I think it's, I'll take jurors at their word. After a trial involving a police officer as a defendant has been completed, and that police officer has been acquitted, and most everybody in the community believes he should have been found guilty, here's what you'll hear. Oh, I put myself in the shoes of a, of a police officer. What a tough job, is a juror saying. Uh, man, could I do it? Would I do it? No. I couldn't do it. I wouldn't do it. So who am I to judge a police officer who um, takes on this incredibly dangerous and, and sensitive role in our society? Um, we need to give them the benefit of the doubt. That is not of course, what the law says. The law says you need to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that an individual, a defendant, whether he be a police officer or not, committed the crime accused. So uh, it's, it's, it's a situation in which social truth prevails over science, over law, over what we know to be the case. Uh, and I suspect that that will always, that phenomenon will never evaporate. It will always be a part of our reality. 
is that we make personal decisions. We make emotional decisions when we're being called upon to make legal decisions. Uh, or in the case of COVID, for example, scientific decisions. The social, the political, the cultural find their way into that equation. It makes it really difficult. Um, but it is true that it has historically been next to impossible to convict a police officer for racism uh, that results in discriminatory police actions, including excessive force uh, and, and uh, or lethal force that we believe is unjustified is that um, the, the average juror, um, I should qualify it, the average white middle-class juror is likely to say, God, I couldn't do that work. So who am I to judge? Well, you shouldn't be on this jury. I mean, somebody did a bad job at, 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 at voir dire. I mean, somebody should have, should have, made sure that the right questions were asked because if that's your rationale, if you have a solid rationale that you have really thought through and you've done it in good faith for acquittal, vote your conscience and explain that to the reporter who asks you afterwards. B but if you're flying by the seat of your pants and you're making emotional decisions, you should not be on a jury. Simple. Well, we're, we're hoping to to, to sort of change that with this series by demystifying the yeah. police. Because I think, you know, we have concluded over the, the last months or in the last year that people have a really, really distorted image of what policing entails. You know, it's, it's, not, as, it's not the most dangerous job in the world. You know, they don't go out shooting people, you know, like, like on SU, SVU, you know, they, there's three or four shootouts and one, one hour show. Sure. And so I think that uh, what we hope is that we will begin to see as people are having conversations all over the United States uh, with people like you. Um, and, and we hope that we will in some ways demystify uh, the I think policing is more of an art than it is. Um, you know, you you've got to be able to talk to people, et cetera. But we're not, we're you have been so gracious, and uh, Stan and Zora Lynn are going to take us out. But I just need to say, Norm, and and let our audience know that you responded right away, and and uh, especially you know we we sometimes don't hear from people when we tell them we have no money. Uh, but you that didn't seem to make a difference to you. And and I, I'm just so grateful. We're all so grateful that you have given us uh, almost two hours of your time. And, and we thank you. Well, I thank you very much, Mary and, and uh, Zora Lynn and Stan and, and, and Robbie and everybody else, Jeremy and even the guy that had to run off and make sure that his pregnant girlfriend is doing okay. I mean, uh, Marlo. Yeah, Marlo. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I hope that, that she's fine and, yeah. that, uh, and that he is as well, because that's yes. got to be tense. Yeah. But thank you so much for inviting me. It's, it's been a total pleasure. Uh, you've been wonderful. Thank you so much, Norm. We really enjoyed your conversation. Thank you. Very thank much you for joining us and we want to also thank our audience for of course joining us today.